When Davie County was formed in 1836, the debate over slavery was already raging and threatening to divide the country. In 1861, the Civil War engulfed the nation. A Davie County man, Hinton Rowan Helper, and a book he wrote played a leading role in the drama which led to secession and the Civil War. Helper was born in 1829 in the small log part of this house at the former Squire Boone site, Highway 64 West at Bear Creek. The house is in the National Register and has been designated a National Historic Landmark, reflecting Helper's role in American history. Helper's book was published about four years before the Civil War began. In May 1857, Helper, then living in New York, wrote Dr. James McGuire of Moxville, my new work, The Impending Crisis of the South, How to Meet It, will be in market about the 1st of July. This controversial book, The Impending Crisis, was about abolishing slavery. The book was destined to make Hinton Rowan Helper's name perhaps the best known name in the United States for a time and the most hated name in the South. In his book, The Impending Crisis, Helper, a radical slavery abolitionist, proposed getting rid of slavery by any necessary means, including murder of slave owners. Along with Uncle Tom's Cabin, the Helper book was a most influential volume which fanned the flame of hatred between the North and South and led to secession and civil war in 1861. The book was deliberately biased, full of errors, and void of logic. A debate over the book delayed the election of the Speaker of the House of Representatives in Washington for two months in December and January, 1859-1860. During those two months, the debate about the book was so heated that congressmen went to the House chamber armed, some with two revolvers and a boy knife. The book was a major influence in the election of Lincoln in 1860, and Lincoln's election brought secession and war. This is a notice of a local meeting to discuss secession. Only about one out of five Davie County families owned slaves, and many of these owned only one slave family. Opinion about withdrawing from the Union was very divided. In February 1861, Davie citizens voted almost three to one against secession. However, Fort Sumter, April 9, 1861, brought almost unanimous support for secession and war. Records such as this muster roll name the known 1,326 Confederate soldiers from the county. This was about one of every four of the total white population of the county and included a large number of teenage boys. Eight volunteer companies were organized. Other men were drafted. 265 Davy soldiers are known to have died in the Civil War. This is more than three times the number of Davy soldiers who died in all other wars. This is a Civil War tax in kind receipt. This 10% tax paid in agricultural products was levied on larger farmers to help feed Confederate armies. Confederate tax wagons traveled to farms to collect the taxed items. On small farms, wives and children with broken down plows, starving mules and horses tried to grow food. To try to alleviate hunger, Davy County officials bought corn and salt from Virginia and South Carolina 
to divide among the soldiers' families. No picture can depict the intensity of the suffering in the later years of the war. Hunger, malnutrition, and lack of clothes, shoes, and medicine were widespread. Large numbers of soldiers deserted the army and came home to their suffering families. Confederate soldiers also endured extreme privations and continually rode home for food, clothing, and shoes. A 3,000-man Union Army under the command of General George Stoneman marched across the county on April 11, 1865. It left one man murdered, burned the vacant cotton factory, and threw some records out of the courthouse windows, but did not ravage the county. People hid valuables, jewelry, food, horses, cows, hogs, and some families cooked food for the soldiers, especially the officers, to get favors and protection. Jesse A. Clement family spread a white substance, probably flour, on cured meat and told Union soldiers it had been poisoned by other Union troops. In this Moxville house, then located near the present depot, a Union soldier demanding gold and silver money held a pistol to Mrs. Braxton Bailey's head and set fire to a bed pillow. He left just before the house caught fire, as this scorched board shows. In several instances, faithful former slaves persuaded Stoneman's Union soldiers not to harm or kill former masters or their families. After the Civil War, all the southern states were required to adopt new state constitutions. The 1868 court minutes record officers recently elected under the new Constitution of North Carolina. Boards of elected county commissioners assume taxing and administrative authority, and a separate court system was established. The Civil War left the South in ruins, and the task of rebuilding was slow. Trade and travel were difficult because of poorly maintained dirt roads and lack of bridges. Until about the 1920s, rivers were still crossed on a ferry like this one. A cable stretched between large trees on each side of the river kept the ferry from floating downstream. The building of the railroad from Winston to Advance to Moxville in 1891 was an event of great importance. This is a Sunday afternoon crowd to see the train at the Moxville Depot about 1900. Until 1899, a turntable pushed by hand turned the engine around. The engine pulled the train from Winston and pushed it back. The first county newspaper, the Davy Times, began weekly publication in 1880. This was an event of major significance. The first large industry came in 1899 when the Irwin Mills Company built a cotton mill and the town of Coulomie. The site on the South Yadkin River was chosen because of available water power. Some 360 houses were built and rented to employees. The mill later employed approximately 1,300 people. The mill closed its major operation in 1969. This is part of the original downtown business area. It was demolished in 1963. The now famous Masonic picnic began in 1878. Shown here is an invitation to the picnic and an announcement of the Confederate Soldiers' Reunion of 1892. In the early 1900s, a special train of former Davy County people, then living and working in Winston, made a day's excursion to the picnic. 
The annual picnic, now sponsored by the Corinthian Masonic Lodge No. 17 and the Davy Educational Union, began about 1894. Proceeds support the Central Masonic Orphanage at Oxford and local educational scholarships. Five churches were organized in the county before the Revolutionary War. The Moxville First Presbyterian Church, formerly Joppa, was at Joppa Cemetery for about 70 years. Timber Ridge Meeting House was at the present Bethlehem Methodist Church site. Fork Baptist Church and Eaton's Baptist Church are at their original sites. The Heidelberg Evangelical Lutheran Church was probably the first organized congregation in the county. The Cedar Grove Baptist Church near Fork, organized 1862, is the oldest known black congregation in the county. Before the Civil War, some blacks were members of the white churches. They usually sat in balconies during the worship services. A most impressive structure is the Fulton Methodist Church, built in 1888 in the Gothic Revival style of architecture. It is in the National Register of Historic Places. The building has undergone extensive restoration beginning in 1990. Little is known of the earliest schools. The Cokesbury School, built about 1790 near Advance, was the first Methodist-sponsored school in North Carolina. Shown here is an artist's conception of the schoolhouse. Foundation stones remain to mark the site. In 1799, the building no longer a school housed a church. Until free public schools were established by North Carolina law in 1839, only private academies charging tuition were available, and only children whose parents were able to pay went to school. The Moxville Academy, chartered in 1826, still stands on Salisbury Street. Several academies in the county continued to function after free public schools were begun. Some academy terms were as long as 10 months. One well-known private academy in the late 1800s for older students was Hodges Business College, built by J.D. Hodges and still standing near Concord Methodist Church on Highway 801. In 1895, the five-month term cost $45, including tuition, board, room, and laundry. Pupils at academies boarded at nearby homes. Free tax-supported public schools began in Davy County in 1839. That year, citizens voted 364 to 73, a five to one majority, in favor of free tax-supported public schools. Terms were two to three months in midwinter when children were not needed on the farms. Approximately one half of the eligible white boys and girls ages six to 21 years attended school in 1860. State law prohibited teaching slave children to read and write, though it was sometimes done privately. Few schools functioned during the Civil War but by 1870, schools were again open, and there were schools for black children also. The Cana School, built about 1890, was one of the larger and better public schools. Note the roofed but open arbor at the rear used primarily for commencement exercises. Commencement exercises were an important part of the school term. When these schoolhouses were built about 1900, 
there were 62 schools in the county, most with one teacher. About half were log buildings. Of these 62 schools, 17 were black schools. This was Cedar Creek School for Black Children in Farmington Township. School terms for all children were three to four months. However, students who could pay went to school additional months. This was known as subscription schooling. A parade by school children in the early 1900s. The school built by the Irwin Mills Company at Coolamy in 1903 was the first graded school in the county and the finest school building at that time. The Moxville School on Cherry Street, a graded school, was built with town bond money in 1911. It was the first brick public school building in the county. This building with a temporary frame building accommodated grades one through 11 until the mid 1920s. Today it houses the school administrative offices. The early 1920s saw a surge of consolidation of small one and te two teacher schools into larger schools, grades one through 11, some with eight months terms and school bus transportation. These consolidated schools were Coolamy, Shady Grove, Farmington, Smith Grove, Moxville, and Davie County Training School. In 1926, the Davie Tra County Training School for black students was built to replace the old frame schoolhouse near the depot. This rear entrance was part of the original building. This school was later Central Davy and became part of the Moxville Middle School. This frame gymnasium at the former Farmington School site and a similar one at Moxville were built about 1930 to replace the outdoor dirt basketball courts and small makeshift courts on the stages of auditoriums. Four large coal-burning stoves comprise the heating system. About 1950, new brick structures replaced the gym facilities at Coolamy, Shady Grove, and Moxville. Three structures built in the late 1800s and still standing vividly depict life of the period. Center Arbor, built at Center Methodist Church in 1876, is still in use. It is in the National Register. The framing timbers are held with wood pegs such as these shown in this collection of pegs and handmade nails. This is Dr. W.C. Martin's office, built at Cana about 1889. It now stands in the yard of the restored 1839 jail. The Cane store, built at Cana about 1885, was one of the many general stores in the county in the late 1800s. It also housed the post office. Though no longer standing, a family residence, Marchmont, near Advance, was a very large Italianate-style frame house built in 1885 by William Boo March on a high eminence overlooking the Yadkin River. Before the establishment of orphanages, children whose parents had died, or even those whose father had died, were often bound out by the court to individuals or families to work or to become apprentices to learn a trade. The youth worked without pay except for his food and shelter. 
This entry in the Davie County Court Minutes for May 29, 1839, reads, Gordon Whitaker, orphan, bound to William Lunn, to learn the art and mystery of farming, to receive a freedom suit of clothes worth $20, saddle and bridle worth $10, and teach him to read and write and cipher to the rule of three and furnish such other things as the law requires." End quote. Upon reaching the ages of 21 for young men and 18 for young women, they were free to begin their adult life. In addition to the items mentioned, they sometimes received tools with which to work a trade. Care of those in need has always been part of our government structure. In the mid-1800s, about $1 out of $5 of the county taxes was for poor relief. Some of these people lived in county-owned housing. The last such facility, known as the county home, was built in 1908 for 28 residents. Those able to work did housekeeping chores, and raised food crops and hogs, chickens, and cows. A pest house to quarantine persons with contagious diseases, especially smallpox, and a TB cottage for treatment of anyone with tuberculosis were located on the county home property. The county home operation closed in 1955. Davy County men and women have answered the call to duty in the military struggles in which our nation has engaged. This memorial marker near the courthouse records the names of 265 Confederate dead and 83 additional Davy County men who gave their lives in World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and Beirut, Lebanon. A soldier from Davy County played a leading role in ending World War II. Colonel Thomas W. Ferriby stands beside this marker on Highway 64 West. Colonel Ferriby was the bombardier who dropped the first atomic bomb on Japan. Government and service centers include the Moxville Town Hall, built in 1976. The town was incorporated in 1839. In 1985, Coolamie voted to become an incorporated town. About 1900, Advance functioned as an incorporated town for several years. The Davy County Courthouse was built in 1909. It is in the National Register. The addition on the right was built in 1971. A large addition to the rear was completed in 1990. This handsome new county administrative building was also completed in 1990. Our handsome and spacious Davie County Public Library enlarged and renovated in 1992 is a most valuable asset to our county and its people. The Martin Wall History Room at the County Library houses an extensive collection of local history, in large measure the result of the untiring efforts of county historian Miss Flossie Martin. Historical papers and other memorabilia given by the late Jane and Mary McGuire are an important part of the room collection. The history room serves hundreds of people each year, especially those searching family genealogy. Plan to visit it and research items of local history or family genealogy of interest to you. Ours is a rich heritage May this glance in retrospect serve to deepen our appreciation of this heritage 
and strengthen our resolve to preserve it and to maintain the quality of life we now enjoy.